Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today we're going to talk about Hermes, the archetype of Hermes, a bit of the mythology, and the way that the stories of Hermes have influenced and shaped some of our understanding about the analytic process. Deb and I are going to be doing the podcast today because Lisa is away on a trip. I'll begin with a quote by Carl Karenje. There was a third way of living life, besides the Apollonian rational and the Dionysian irrational. Hermes' way, the way of roguery, god of jokes and journeys, thieves and magicians, the tricky guide of souls. Hermes, the only one that is going to rob you or enrich you, enlighten you, or screw you. The split-second timing. The spirit of finding and thieving. You know, it's really remarkable to think of that as a third major function because it is so entrancing and so elusive and yet, I think, instantly recognizable of that quicksilvery thing that we recognize that is neither Apollonian, well-reasoned, disciplined, thoughtful, nor nor is it the Dionysian sort of pleasure uh, principle. So we have quite a task in front of us of walking around this elusive and yet incredibly appealing image. And where does that live in the psyche? Well, I think that when Jung came upon alchemy and the alchemists, both as physical scientists, but also the philosophical alchemists, wrote extensively about mercury. And when they anthropomorphized it, they turned it into an an entity, mercurius. And because mercury had these inexplicable natural qualities as a substance that could act on these other minerals in a way that there was no scientific explanation because science was in its infancy. It carried a magical, numinous dimension to it. And Jung also wondered about it as a psychological reality. So to just create a a little moment of chemical magic, the alchemists, through their experiments, discovered that They could take a piece of ore, kind of pulverize it, put it in a vessel, add mercury or quicksilver. And many of us who are older (laughs) remember being in biology or chemistry class and our teacher would pour a little bit of mercury in our hands, which of course now is a terrible thing to do. You kind of roll it around and toy with it and people would lose it. It would bounce off somewhere under the radiator and sure we were all inhaling that for the rest of this semester. But when mercury is added to these ores and then it's heated and a bit of a coolant coil would be put over the top and then into a capturing uh, vase, the mercury would actually specifically dissolve the tiny fragments of gold in the ore. And then as it continued to boil, the mercury would vaporize or fly or spiritualize, it would travel through the cooling coils and then drip into the receiving vase and be totally unchanged. After all the mercury had been evaporated, a coating of gold could be left on the inside of the vase. So if we just look at that incredible magical thing that these uh, early chemists were observing, they then made certain assumptions that 
Mercury was a spirit, and it was a spirit that could make hidden things visible, i.e. makes the gold visible in the thing where you couldn't see it, that it's able to travel out of this liquid state, vaporize, and then return to a liquid state, and be unchanged by the chemical operation, and be able to be used over and over and over again. So Mercury was the great dissolving agent that was essential in order to eventually be able to find the hidden gold. Wow. Uh, so Mercury Quicksilver is the agent of transformation. Uh, he himself, the Quicksilver itself, is unchanged, but it can change its states and still somehow remain the same. And it certainly um, gives rise to understanding how it is that Hermes, or Mercury, if he's uh, going by the Roman name, uh, has wings uh, mm -hmm. uh, on his uh, ankles and head and so on. And he is the only god of all of the pantheon of Mount Olympus who can traverse all three realms, from Mount Olympus to Earth and down to Hades, where he was the guide of souls, the psychopomp that led people below ground. I also think a little family history here as a footnote. Who was Hermes? Uh, well, he was, his father was Zeus, but his mother was named Maya, a nymph. Uh, so he was not born of two uh, Olympians uh, in terms of his parentage. He was a little bit of a combination of a little bit of an outsider, and also, of course, one of Zeus's sons. And as soon as he was born, he was a trickster. He was, you know, born basically with all his faculties, but he's depicted as a child. And one of the first things that he did was to steal half of Apollo's herd of cattle uh, and denied it. Said, no, I didn't. <laughs> And Apollo was so amused uh, at his audacity of this young newborn that he forgave him. And in return, Hermes found a tortoise and made the first lyre out of the tortoise shell, which he gave to Apollo. So there is a quality of his audacity, his amorality, and yet his charm and bestowing the gift of the lyre that gives a little bit of an initial portrait uh, of his personality. Is he good? Is he bad? Is he uh, a child? Is he a wise child? Mm -hmm. He's, and the answer is yes to all of it. And one tone throughout all of his stories is that he is one of the friendliest gods. Mm that even though he's a bit of a stinker, you know, with Apollo playing these tricks, but none of the gods really go to war with Hermes while they will really fight with each other in hair raising ways. And Hermes is also one of the friendliest gods to human beings. I don't think there's any stories of Hermes killing people or blighting them and cursing them. So that hermetic freedom, grants him a kind of non-reactive, non-neurotic yeah. relationship to all of these other figures because he is unaffected, which means people don't upset him, people don't scare him, people don't piss him off. He's just in a good mood. Yes, He's just being himself in this uh, amoral and shameless kind of innocence. Uh, he is completely free to be, to be himself. He's not obligated. He doesn't have specific duties that he feels he really needs to perform, uh, like some of the other gods. He is inherently playful. And he is the servant of the gods. I mean, they give him these messenger, mm -hmm. messages and tasks here and there. But, you know, he's the guy that makes the gods' lives easier. So, of course, he's appreciated in that realm. And he's not caught up in power complexes, unlike other gods, mm -hmm. which are really warring between their realms. Hermes kind of steers clear of all that. He's a, he's a smooth operator. The way that I've begun to think about Hermes is 
that he is the between. He is a kind of elusive connecting principle, and he has a whole ton of, of functions. He is a messenger. He's a mediator. He's the god of transitions. Uh, you know, most notably in in the myths, the transition from living to the underworld of Hades. He's the god of intercourse, of commerce, travel, thresholds, uh, transformations. He is associated with the night of things that happen in the night, the thief of the gates, um, a child of many a while and cunning counsel. That's from the Odyssey. Uh, he has a magic wand, the caduceus, that we're all very familiar with, that he then gives to Apollo. Am I right about that? Or Apollo gave it to him? If I'm remembering, I think Apollo gave it to him, extending yes. some aspect of his healing capacity to Hermes. Yeah. So he is both the connecting principle and he slips away. Mm -hmm. Just like Quicksilver does, he slips away, he doesn't stay, but in a way he is intuition and he is the inseminating principle of things like ideas. Yes, I think he's very much associated with the ego at its best, in as much as our minds, our human minds, can travel very, very swiftly between all kinds of ranges of ideas, we can pick up a concept, put it back down, mm -hmm. even think ridiculous things or even dangerous things and then step away from them. And somehow the human ego at that level of thought can actually be bold and venture almost anywhere. And so long as it remains in the realm of thought, it is not particularly dangerous, but it can be wildly inseminating. Yeah enlivening. You know, when I stopped to think about um, where did I get that idea? Did I get it? Or did it somehow arrive like Hermes? You know, I might have been wrestling with a, with a problem or uh, some kind of project that I'm working on. And then all of a sudden, I, I have an idea? Or did Hermes come you know, and lightly land in my head somewhere and give me this idea. And I, I think very much it's that. It's my ego didn't do it, but it's coming into my ego and fertilizing it with another way of thinking about something or something totally radically new and different. Non sequitur, except it makes sense. But Hermes is able to, as you said, to link and as the messenger, I mean, there's a way in which there's some insight from another part of the psyche that can become sensible to the ego because something bridges it. And that that mercurial aspect of consciousness is able to fly between these <laughs> different things. And sometimes it's guided by intuition. Sometimes it's guided by some of the other functions. And that, that we rely on that. What's interesting as we talk about one of the mythologic figures is there's an interesting feeling that's generated when we attribute some of these qualities to a transpersonal archetypal matrix. And I think that this is something that Jung was lamenting about when he said that, you know, the gods have become symptoms, that because the images of the ancient gods or these archetypal representations of psychic factors have fallen into the unconscious and been replaced by an excessive mathematical rationality that the ego loses relationship with these forces. So one of the ways that we can create a structure in the psyche that works better for us is to be able to learn about and hold these images of the gods and to think of them as mm -hmm. psycho-spiritually real. And this was the great gift of Hillman. I mean, Hillman's, I mean, there, there are better apologists for James Hillman than myself, 
But one of my takeaways is his return to the autonomy of the image and the archetype that Hermes really does have a life of his own and that we can learn about the gods, learn about these powerful images, but we do not control them. And just as you said, Deb, Hermes kind of shows up (laughs) and has its way. And maybe it's your imagination, maybe it's something else and gifts what he gifts. Yeah. Hermes shows up. He does what he does. He, He gives gifts. He tricks us. Uh, and he's very much like the the image of of Mercury or Quicksilver that you you described of the silver ball. Is it liquid? Is it metal? It rolls around. It's magical uh, and entrancing in in some way. And I'm thinking very much about how it's a connecting principle between consciousness and the unconscious, and that something can just erupt out of the unconscious and pop in as an idea, perhaps a new idea to a life problem. And uh, you know, I'm thinking about somebody who was wrestling with a life problem of you know, whether to take a new job that was going to be a lot more responsibility, a lot of travel, um, stressful, uh, you know, certainly a lot more money, or whether to stay and not have his whole family have to move and so on and so forth, and back and forth and back and forth about whether, you know, should I go or should I stay? And then one day comes in and says, I know, I know what it is. It's like, what? Fun. (laughs) I need to have more fun. (laughs) It sounds like a message from Hermes. Absolutely. Exactly. And that that was exactly it. It It's a completely unexpected thing, but it had really landed that, wait a minute, life has gotten heavy and rigid. And, you know, I have these two choices and I have to pick one or the other. And that, to go back to what you were just saying, is, uh, is very much like symptoms. And that's what symptoms do to us. They make us rigid and locked in, and a, a set way of being, a set way of thinking about things. And it's, it's when Hermes visits that all of a sudden the new thing comes in that is, whoa, wait a minute, the meaning of life is something that should be enlivening, n- not a question of should I make a move or should I stay where I am. For me, Hermes' contribution to that is that he helps us disidentify with the objects around us. So like we're in the job and we're like, oh, should I quit? I don't know. You know, they've depended on me for all these years, but there's a great job over here that I've been offered. Hermes needs to come in and lighten our relationships between things to make them more fluid and even dissolve some of the places where we are embedded. So in the same way that the gold is embedded in the ore and then it's dissolved and then liberated, we also need that loosening impact of Mercury to say, you know, I could slip out of this situation. And Mercury is also particularly nonviolent. You know, Aries might go to war to to leave that corporation, for instance. Hermes doesn't go to war. He just he just moves away and zips out the door. No complaints, no drama, with a smile on his face, maybe making a joke as he's heading out the door. But that's the gift of Hermes, is that he moves lightly through the world. Now, there's a downside of that. Also, I mean, we all know our mercurial sides, or we know people who are children of Hermes, who really struggle to get traction, or they move so lightly through the world that they never quite seem sincere about anything. So too much of the Hermes archetype can leave us a little bit too light touch in our lives. But when we need Mercury, he frees us up through this disidentification process. And I wonder if he particularly tends to free us up, you know, when we're at a crossroads. You know, life crossroads of uh, which way should I go? What should I choose? 
which direction am I going in? And uh, in the ancient world, they built herms, markers of stones, to mark the crossroads, and uh, that Hermes would be present there. And uh, travelers would leave drink and food at these crossroads for one another. For the next person who was at the crossroads, uh, who perhaps didn't have supplies, uh, that there was a real blessing there. Uh, this is the place of Hermes. If you ask him, he will come. But we have to have that, that uh, spirit of a non-ego spirit at the crossroads. Who left this food? Which way do I go? And that it's not going to be a decision always made by thinking. There has to be that lightness that you were talking about. The guide of souls he's, is one of his names. I think the uh, coming back to this idea of friendliness, even the idea that travelers would leave a resource yes. at a crossroads, yeah. which is also a tribute to the spirit of friendliness that one would hope and one would carry as we're moving through foreign lands or we're moving away from home. And of course, roads themselves mm -hmm. are these, you know, places of travel. And Hermes' primary task was traveling between the realms to deliver these messages. So anytime that we're traveling, there is an invocation of Hermes for all of us, I think. The Herm, I think I had read this, that the root of the word herm actually refers to a, a pile of stones. It's actually a very pragmatic kind of term. And that the idea of Hermes seems to have predated the Greco-Roman gods substantially. It's a much more ancient archetype that shows up. And, and as the image of Hermes developed culturally, it moved from a loose pile of stones into these increasingly carved structures that were, that were curated and there was an artistic sensibility to it. First carved phalluses and then, interestingly enough, these long rectangular columns with the head of Hermes at the top and just the erection coming out of the uh, rectangle, which to me has always seemed like a sarcophagus in a sense. And mm that in this long column of stone, you know, the mystery of the God comes out only in two ways, through the mind and through the genitals. Yeah. And all the other parts are embedded in this mystery. People had, the, had uh, herms outside their homes as well uh, that often were square of a, mm. a fourness, which for Jung, of course, is the principle of wholeness. Uh, and we kind of know that, you know, crossroads, the four directions, four principles of ego function, the list of fours goes on and on, four apostles, and uh, what else? Help me out here, Joseph. <laughs> but just the feeling of completeness. Yes, exactly. And um, marrying that with the phallic image really is a symbol of both instinctual inseminating power and spiritual wholeness. So uh, psychically, it's not so surprising that these two images, uh, you know, evolved over time as one thing. Uh, this was, uh, you know, a natural, you know, every day you saw these outside people's homes mm -hmm. of instinct and spirit and marking the way that there is a path in the dark, mm -hmm. which brings us back to what you had said earlier is that Hermes is assigned the role of the psychopomp, which uh, means the guide of souls, pomp meaning guide, psyche meaning soul. Mm -hmm. and so the story is that when Greeks would die, they would go down into the underworld, but they would also be lost, that it was strange and unfamiliar. And if they drank from the river Lethe, they had just absolute uh, loss of all memory. So there was a spirit that was required to companion them through this underworld journey 
to find their place in the underworld, but also to be able to, for those of us who do inner work, to be able to go down into the underworld with our analysands and to be able to return unscathed. Mm. And that's where the role of Hermes is so aligned with analytic work. Because if the analyst was to go into the underworld and to be wounded by the unconscious material or overwhelmed or to be filled with it in a, in a way that made the analyst compromised in their functioning, it'd be an almost impossible career. So some spirit has to help us as analysts to witness, to companion, but to not be overwhelmed by the material we encounter. Yes, that we can both uh, enter and depart. Uh, we can slip in like Quicksilver and also slip out. It's a both and. I'm also thinking of um, the psychopomp, uh, which uh, in a conversation that one of my grandkids overheard and who later referred to this as the psychopomp, which I, <laughs> uh, which from an eight-year-old perspective makes a whole lot of sense, and I really like Perfect it a sense. lot. It's a big improvement um, in the I terminology. Like um, but the psychopomp, uh, I think, also operates internally as the dream maker. Oh, don't you think? About that. Well, uh, you can make a case for that. I can see it. <laughs> make a case. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to put on my litigator's hat here. Um, <laughs> that there is something that slips into our awareness when we can recall a dream mm -hmm. that does not seem perhaps to have a direct bearing on a life situation. But if we sit with it a little bit, it often does. And, of course, I'm thinking about dreams uh, in the ancient world and the temples of Asclepius, and there were two or three hundred of them around the Levant uh, where people would make a pilgrimage, basically, and and kind of see a therapist and incubate, ask for a dream to help resolve a life situation. Uh, question that they had that really mattered or they wouldn't have made the pilgrimage to the temple. And that it's a, a good image for the relationship between uh, ego and waking state consciousness and the unconscious and th the life and insight, imagery, information, and knowing that a dream can provide. And that that's, a her that's the principle of Hermes who he arrives to help us out just as um, he helped out Odysseus on his travels. Uh, he just shows up out of what you were talking about before, the friendly spirit of and playful of like, well, here I am. I'm thinking about that. Is he the dream maker? I'm just trying that on. <laughs> well, I mean, because when I th think about... Dreams are messages, in a way. We could use that paradigm. Mm -hmm. And then I could see that Mercury being the psycho-spiritual principle that allows us, for instance, to remember the dream so that we just don't uh, forget everything when we transition from the underworld into the waking life. So Hermes is the one that keeps the message intact in between. But I'm thinking of whether I whether I hold Hermes as a wisdom figure or whether Hermes is the holder of the, the seed idea of the incarnation, of the holder of the self, I'd have to really meditate on that, whether that... You know, you know what? I think you're right, that Hermes is the messenger, just as he was where uh, the gods assigned him, you know, hey, Hermes, would you mind taking a message down to Hades down there in the underworld? Uh, we really actually need him to let Persephone come back on up to Earth. And Hermes says, okay, sure, I'm your guy. I think you're right that he is the messenger who delivers the contents of a dream, not from Zeus, but from the self, from that central fire, the mystery, the, the something greater. 
and he, he delivers it. I, I like that much better, and I think that uh, fits more, too, with, with Jungian theory and what's really true. You know, there's something so appealing about Hermes. The other thing I, to talk about um, for me with Hermes is that there's a way in which he's the god of humor as well. He's the god of tricks, but also the delight in tricks. <laughs> yeah. like I, I was just rethinking about our April Fool's episode on oh my the god. erotic stamp collection and that that squealing feeling when we were putting together this big fabrication, this silly fabrication and the pleasure in even, even kind of harmless tricking that comes up and you and I mm -hmm. just tossing all of this made up stuff back yes. and forth. I mean, that's to me, that's like Hermes all over the place and delighting in it. Yeah. The spirit of play, but there's a saucy flavor to it. A, be a little kind of daring that goes a little beyond just being silly to kind mm -hmm. of push the limits a bit of like, mm -hmm. do we really dare to uh, <laughs> do a podcast about Jung's erotic stamp collection? That is pretty. <laughs> it still makes me yeah. squeal a little bit <laughs> inside. But it does very much capture the spirit of, of Hermes, that irreverence. Mm -hmm. And that spirit of play and wickedness, like the infant Hermes, just steal half of Apollo's cattle. Why not? Mm -hmm. But just go ahead and go for it. And you can imagine him just hiding somewhere, just laughing yes. his tail off. Yeah. Because it's so funny to be the tricker. Yeah. So that, that spirit. And I also think that because this force is woven into us as human beings, that that same laughing, joking force activates in us as human beings in order to create breathing room. Mm. You know, it's an amazing thing that mm -hmm. in the collective, a terrible event will happen. And then the, the culture at large will go through a grieving process, fear, and all these different reasonable reactions. But when the comedians start making fun of it, and it starts showing up in the collective, then there's a sign that the culture is trying to find a way to fly above the trauma, to try to get breathing room, mm. and to find something absurd, strange, incongruent, even in tragedy, which allows us to radically shift our perception of something and find it bizarre enough to laugh about. I think that is such a really good point of what this kind of trickster, divine defiance, that it's not about, you know, I'm going to get at you, I'm going to do something transgressive. Uh, it, it's not strategic. It just rises right above that in a spirit of glorious play and the poking fun and some of the comedians that are that are out there on uh, shows that you can get on online all the time do exactly that they take it on and they they dare to make fun poke fun and be a little really transgressive and wicked about it but not because they want anything in return except to have a different stance of i insist on this stance that is very hermetic, very fluid, very slippery. Sometimes it's very sharp, mm -hmm. and yet it's also very funny and daring of like, oh, my God, can you dare to take that on? You poked fun at you know some special sacred cow in the culture. And that's what we did on that podcast uh, uh, <laughs> about Jung's erotic stamp collection, which, by the way, I blame you for. <laughs> I am totally accountable for that. I was the devilish imp in the room for sure. You were the principal of Hermes, and and it was delicious. I was irresistible. And so that feeling also keeps us unstuck the way Hermes was unstuck. You know, we find ourselves in all kinds of stresses and tragedies, or at least anxiety-provoking situations. And boy, what that moment where people can kind of laugh and cry at the same time 
is almost always a sign of that hermetic loosening, that all of the pent-up feeling is coming out in the crying, but all of this shift of perspective and the certain kind of existential absurdity of something also happens. And that's a great loosening moment and I think can only be achieved with the help of Hermes because nothing in the situation makes it seem laughable at all. As we've talked, I've come more and more to appreciate the quote that you offered at the beginning from Karenyi, who was a great student of of mythology and has written a, a lot of interpretive books about especially uh, Greek and ancient um, Mediterranean uh, mythology. So we'll put that in the in the show notes um, and uh, another another mythologer, uh, Pedrosa, if you want to know more about it. But I am appreciating so much that this is the third way of being, the enlivening, playful, amoral, quicksilvery, connecting principle. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have it, wow, life can get life can get either very heavy in the ways that we often refer to as Apollonic, you know, or maybe the other opposite, it can get very too Dionysian, uh, too, you know, too intense, too intense and too much of seeking the pleasure principle uh, that can lead to addiction. And how do we go between? And in those moments, we really do need Hermes both to go down into the pit mm -hmm. to help us get out, but also to loosen us up so we're not so trapped, we're not holding so tightly to things. I also want to bring up the side of Hermes, who I think is the god of the personae. Because he's the trickster, he's the god of disguises, then we know he's the god of masks, costumes, taking on different looks, seeming different ways. Other trickster gods like Loki literally would transform gender and sex and appearance and become an animal and then come back mm. to becoming a man. So he, he also embodies this mercurial feeling that you can just pour mercury into any mold and it takes the shape of that mold. As the god of costumes and trickery, he is the god of personae and the instinct of how to garb ourselves so that we can achieve certain ends. And, and I think that is, that is an archetypal reality. Again, it, it separates us from the drive to be sincere, but it is also in another part of play, as you were saying, Deb, this play at being different people or different aspects of ourselves. And we do this all the time. You know, you have a particular outfit you wear to go for an interview for a job that's high powered and you really want it. And you'll dress differently to go out on a Saturday night and, you know, meet new people at a club, etc. differently at a wedding. So we naturally have these different persona and these different masks, but the delight in that is interesting. And I really do. I, I have lots of friends who just delight in dyeing their hair blue this month. <laughs> and then it's gray the next month and, you know, and just piercing some other new part of their body and then getting a tattoo over here and this constant mercurial changing of appearance, not that it's just happening, but that it's so delicious for them. And I think that also speaks to that aspect of Hermes that's delights in the persona. That's a really um, interesting uh, point that ties in, in a way, with the trickster of, mm -hmm. of how do I want to appear to you? And we bring intention to it. As you said, you know, we think about what we're going to wear to a, a mm -hmm. job interview or a Halloween party or, you know, a hundred other things of what guys do I wish uh, to take on and play. I'm playing a role. And yes, it's genuine uh, genuineness, particularly one hopes if uh, you're interviewing for a job, 
and yet also a role. It is and it isn't me. Yeah, that, that middle place where we have a foot in both worlds, which goes yes. to the liminality. One foot in the underworld, one foot in the middle world. And not only just being in various places, but being comfortable, being yeah. unburdened by having these different places that we flow to. Because each of those things, uh, building on your idea of a costume or an appearance or a persona, one of our persona, mm -hmm. it, it really is a genuine part of us, that we really mm -hmm. are genuinely playing the part, uh, let's say, at a Halloween costume of whatever that figure is that we have chosen to inhabit. Why did a person decide to dress up as a wizard uh, versus a werewolf? Well, it kind of represents some part of our inner persona, the cast of characters that we all have inside us, and kind of enact it playfully. And we have a more serious uh, side if we're going to a wedding or a family reunion, or a job interview, or a hundred other things. And that we enjoy accessing uh, all these different parts. And that Hermes helps us hold those different masks lightly, yes. and even with fun. Yes. So Jung wasn't negative about people having personae. He was troubled when people became identified with their personae. Yes. And the Hermes energy really loosens that up. I'm not really a doctor or a lawyer or you know, a dad. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I am, yes, I'm in all those roles, but yeah. I am something more beyond. Yes. And delighting in these roles because I'm not trapped. Yes. Like Hermes, we can slip in and slip out of, you know, now I put on uh, my role uh, as whatever that is, uh, you know, a, a professional, a colleague, uh, whatever my work role is, a family role, on and on it goes. And it's fun. It's, we hope it's fun. And we need Hermes that if we, if we go back to the alchemical process, that people come in for analysis and for the first sometimes year, we're unpacking the prima materia. What happened? When did it happen? How did it feel? Who are you? Who are you on these various levels? And so the substance that we're starting with finally kind of manifests. But in order to extract the gold, Hermes has to yeah. activate in the alchemical process or else we keep like just circling the ore and don't kind of know what to do with it. We really need something that's going to act as a dissolving agent to then free up the various components so then they can be reconfigured ideally on a higher arc through the impress of the self. And one of the ways that I think it's very accessible is that Mercury as a human capacity has to do with the ability to analyze something to the point that it liberates the energy that's trapped in it. So for instance, we have a complex and we've discovered that in the unpacking. It's the relentless circling around the complex and thinking and perceiving, mm -hmm. trying to travel into it, trying to figure out where the gold is in the complex. And at the center of every complex is an archetype or a god or goddess, we would say. And Hermes is friendly to the mm -hmm. god at the center of all our complexes. So it's not like Hermes is trying to hurt something. He's just trying to find it and liberate it. And then he's gone. He doesn't even take any of it. He doesn't take the gold that comes out of the ore. He just liberates that. And then he's, he's on to whatever's next for him. But the spirit of that, I think, is an, is an attitude that we need to cultivate, which goes to the idea of the observing ego, to be able to press so deeply into something that it begins to liquefy. Yes. Something transforms. 
And we can't really pinpoint exactly how that happens or when it happens. And it's not causal that if you do these three things, you know, if you get into psychotherapy or psychoanalysis and you go regularly for four to six months, that then this will happen. And yet, of course, it does happen, doesn't it? That if you do certain things, that somehow there will be a result and effect, uh, a moment that is both somewhat predictable and incredibly surprising. I'll tell a personal story of, of course, a thousand years ago when I was in my first analytic process, letting you wonder how many of them have there been. Um <laughs> Now, my analyst wanted to work with dreams, and I thought, well, that's weird, but never mind. You know, at least one of us has a game plan, so uh, let's go with that. So week after week, I brought in one dream after another after another, and I thought, I don't, I don't all together get this, but it, you know, this person seems to know what she's doing. So here we go. I was diligent, and I wrote them down, and I brought them in, and we talked about them. And then one week, I brought in a dream, and I can still remember this moment mm. that all of a sudden, Hermes arrived. Mm -hmm. I got that this was my dream, and something had happened to me. Mm. Now, did I have an intellectual understanding of what the images and symbols and the so on, the story of the dream were all about? No, but I got that it mattered and something had happened and it meant something. And for me, that's an example of the moment that Hermes shows up. You know, did I quote, make it happen? Yes, no, kind of. Had I not been working with dreams, would that have happened at all? Was it related to the amount of time I spent? No. And yet there it is. And it makes a difference to know that something else operates in you, visits you, comes to you, enlivens you, and it it's there. There's more to you and of you and not of you. Mm. And that enlivening life principle uh, is beyond price. I think that's a beautiful place to transition into a dream. Did you know your dreams reveal the wisdom of your guiding self? Dreams connect us to the secret world within and remind us that we're never alone. We're always accompanied by our inner companion who offers healing, balance, insight, and guidance as we make key decisions. At 28, Charles felt lost and isolated. He had a dream that touched him deeply. As he worked with the dream in dream school, he understood that it was showing him how he was profoundly connected to life. This powerful insight led him to make real progress with his goals. During Dream School's 12-month transformational program, you'll learn to harness the power of your unconscious wisdom, decode the language of metaphor and symbol, discover mythological motives that shape your life, reveal unknown facets of your personality, unlock the door to inner wisdom. To enroll, just go to interpretmydream.net and sign up today to gain immediate access to the first three Dream School modules. Your best life awaits you at Dream School, and we can't wait to see you there. So here is um, a woman's dream. She's 33 years old, and she is a writer and a podcaster. So here's her dream. I'm on a piece of inhabited land by the shore with many others in a beach town. Some of the people I know and some I do not. Across the water is an island. It looks like Devil's Tower in Wyoming, the one in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. But this island is lush, tropical, and Jurassic. It's a beautiful day, close to sunset, and the view is gorgeous. 
All of a sudden, we all realize there are three enormous boats that look like cruise ships balancing on the edge of the top of the island. They're huge, a third the height of the island. One looks old, two look new. No one knows how they got there. There's a theory they went ashore when the water level was higher, but we all know that doesn't make much sense. We would have seen them there long ago, but in this case, they just appeared seemingly out of nowhere. We all realize they're about to fall as they're balanced precariously. As we anticipate an enormous crash, we take shelter. I can see them fall slowly off the top of the island to the base. There is a lot of destruction, so much dust and debris, and the sky gets very hazy, but I am safe. The next morning, we wake up, and it's a beautiful day. The shape of the island across the water is totally different. It's been totally reconstructed by the crash of the boats, which are no longer visible. The island looks a lot less ominous in shape. I look to my left and see that some of the debris from the island has landed in the water, which allowed a bike path to be built from our land to the island across the water. I realize perhaps this crash has actually improved things for the better, and everything feels calm and beautiful. And for context, she says, I've been traveling abroad for a year, and I'm going home to the U.S. in a couple of weeks. I don't have a home there, per se, but intend to stay put for a while as I feel tired. I feel mixed things about going back there. I've learned a lot about myself and the world in the past year, and some of the growth has been challenging. The main feelings in the dream were she felt relatively calm, and I knew so much was happening, big things, but I knew I'd be safe. I was very interested and curious about what the island would look like after the destruction. And to describe some of her associations with significant dream elements, she says, I only have an association with the shape of that island because it looked like Devil's Tower. I've always wanted to go there and really related to the experience of the main character who was channeling information about the future he didn't quite understand. Being drawn to a place he'd never been, but knowing he needed to go because something important was going to happen. She's referring to uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind and that character in the dream. So, Joseph, what do we make of this dream? Mm. It's like a short this story, a, for one thing. <laughs> I was going to say, there's a lot going on. I found myself wanting to group it into three sections. One is just describing this beautiful place. The next is the, the three ships, discovering them, watching them crash. The third is this reconstructive process. So there's a bit of a salve at coagula process. And I'm also struck that the dreamer herself is living a mercurial or hermetic life mm -hmm. in as much as she's been traveling abroad for a year, which is a very much like Hermes. Yes. Just winging around. And people who, who travel well like that, which I find really enviable, are able to move lightly through these multiple circumstances. They don't seem overwhelmed by various coping with various languages and amenities and all these things that there's a hermetic or a, a child of Hermes can do really well with that life. So what do we know about the psychic situation as it is? This is uh, where the dream setting uh, takes on particular value that she's on a piece of inhabited land. So that is uh, stable but it's by the shore, which is that liminal space between land and sea, with many others in a beach town. And she, across the water is this island that looks like Devil's Tower in Wyoming from the movie Close Encounters. And it's lush, tropical, Jurassic, beautiful day, close to sunset, view is gorgeous. So there's the dream setting. And interestingly, in her um, comments, 
this image of Devil's Tower is both, you know, I remember vaguely, at least from the movie, you know, how awful and barren and dark and weird it was. And yet there was such a psychic pull to go toward uh, that particular piece of land. So uh, her Devil's Tower seems to be set, set in a tropical environment. I'm uh, taking a moment to look at some uh, images of Devil's Tower and really appreciating it. And I actually remember that I had, uh, I had glanced this. Um, I spent time in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, so I, have a, I do have a visual sense of it. But, you know, I also think there's a clue um, in her association to close encounters. This, the mountaintop where magical things happen. Right. Of, of where is the close encounter uh, transpiring in her, in this dream. And it seems basically benign. Uh, the island's lush, tropical, and Jurassic, so it's maybe a, a little sort of primordial. Well, I'm also thinking, uh, what was the name of the mountain that uh, Noah's ship landed on after the flood receded? Mount Arafat, uh, which is reputed to be in Armenia. The Armenians take great pride in Noah's Ark having landed there. When I had that uh, that image of these enormous boats teetering on a mountaintop, I was thinking, oh, that's been just <laughs> what, what it was like for Noah. Right. And that's something extraordinary would have had to happen for a boat to get to the top of a mountain like that. It, it creates this fantasy of a flood that has receded. Mm -hmm. And yet it, it is such a bizarre image. I, these cruise ships, you know, I had not seen one up close until a few years ago. They are the size of apartment buildings. They are enormous. And so here are three of these absolutely enormous ships uh, uh, kind of teetering uh, at, at the top of the island. And I'm thinking about cruise ships where we go for pleasure, for a vacation. And they have all kinds, I've never been on one, but they have I've heard stories of people who can you know, go into pools and entertainment and all kinds of restaurants. And I guess the, the list of pleasurable amenities goes on and on. And so it seems like something associated with that is what has run aground and is about to crash. Right. It's not sustainable for whatever this represents to just be teetering yeah. in this uh, dangerous situation. You can't cruise endlessly through life. Right. And it's also um, it's also misplaced. Yes. I mean, an enormous cruise ship shouldn't be on top of a mountain. Like, there's no <laughs> way that that's going to work out well. But it does beg the question of the psychic situation it is trying to speak to. So there's um, something is misplaced, and the psyche is making the correction, mm -hmm. which is that cruise ships can't live teetering on tops of mountains, and that gravity itself this most yes. primal reality mm -hmm. principle is going to amend this and pull these things yeah. back down. You know, in the dream world, maybe they'll slide back into the ocean because mm -hmm. miraculous things can happen. But, but I think that there's no reason for them to continue, you know, spinning around like tops on the, on the mountain. So um, what happens, as you say, here's the encounter, here's the close encounter. And what happens? Uh, the encounter is that they are falling off. They're, and the dream ego says, oh my gosh, you know, it's going to be a crash. So much dust, dust and debris, a lot of destruction. Sky gets hazy, sure, from all the dust. But then when they wake up in the morning, look what's happened. It has changed the shape of the island. Mm -hmm. It's been totally reconstructed. Uh, it looks a lot less ominous. And it has allowed a link, a bike path to be built from the shore to the island. So something that was cut off by water, something that was separated, has now been connected. And the crash has improved things, she says. Everything feels calm and beautiful. 
So it seems like the dream starts out um, with this island cut off that you can look at, and it's lush, tropical, and Jurassic, which kind of implies those um, uh, raptor dinosaurs and the Devil's Tower. So it's both appealing and kind of forbidding. And looking at those images of Devil's Tower, I mean, nobody would want to get stuck on the top of such a, you know, enormously inhospitable place. It seems like such a polarity that this island is lush and tropical, and it has this fearsome Devil's Tower in it. And then when the crash happens of the cruise ships, that when something in the psyche that is represented by cruise ships crashes, it, that is the transformative agent. And she says they fall to the base. Something really momentous has happened in this dream of reshaping this island and connecting it to the mainland. At the same time that she's about to come back uh, home to the U.S. and stay put for a while. So a fantasy that the dream is stirring in me is still moving around this idea of Noah's Ark and mm. uh, Mount Ararat and that whole kind of story. And I think about if this psyche has undergone an enormous flood, a cleansing flood of some kind, the flood has receded, but the process still hasn't finished. The ark, much like a huge cruise line, I think is an image of the mother complex. These enormous contained communities, and there's a way in which people are resting in the womb of these ships and gestating and, and sustaining life in an inhospitable flood. So the flood has received, but there are still these vestigial complexes that are teetering around, which I think are the last bit of the mother complex. That as the dreamer is going through a transition, and she's willing to kind of settle down for a little while someplace, it seems like the old version of the mother complex has finally finished its its usefulness. It's finally toppled from the mountain. It's crashed down. And that the loss of the fantasy of being taken care of, which I think is very much about being on a cruise ship, by the way, because a lot <laughs> of people are like, uh, just treated like big babies fed constantly. The and indulgent mother, anything absolutely. you want, honey. Exactly. So that's kind of crashed off the mountain she wants to stay safe, safe around it, but she also doesn't seem invested in trying to prop it up. She's, she's not even going to try to intercede. And now that that's crashed down, her life can be redesigned in these different ways, and a calm beauty is able to manifest. And I think because the last bit of the fantasy of constantly being cared for has crashed. Nature has taken it away. Gravity. Yeah, uh, that uh, feels right to me. And I'm thinking about a couple of different things. One is the difference between the calm, sort of the beautiful setting at the outset of the dream that nevertheless has an island that, gee, it has Devil's Tower in it, and also, it's Jurassic, so, you know, how good could this really be? And at the end of the dream, um, it's simply calm and beautiful. And the, the other is a kind of, a, a kind of, literally a fall in the dream from a kind of grandiose cruise ship uh, image, images of three of them. Uh, and that's how you get around in the world is on a cruise ship. Versus a bike path. <laughs> and isn't that nice? A bike path has been um, built and you can bike over and back, which is a much more grounded, human, physical, ordinary uh, mode of transportation. 
And it's powered by her. Exactly. I mean, when you're on a cruise ship, you know, whatever's powering it, it's, it's very far away from you as a passenger, but you're on a bicycle. It's the pistons of your legs are going to get you wherever it is you decide to go. So it's more intimate, more homey, more grounded, more human, more autonomous, more about her own energy. And then that improves things. It makes things better. I think it's a really propitious dream. I, I think this person is in a really good process. Yep. I want to say welcome home. Welcome home. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.